Welcome back, boys and girls. Today we're going to read chapter three of Poppy. Poppy Alone. Poppy glanced to the east. The horizon was streaked with layers of pink and red. Did that make it night or day? Neither. It was impossible to guess. Then, if the owl was still awake, as he was at night, or asleep, as he was by day. Besides, the place in Dimwood Forest where Mr. Okak slept, not the same as his watching post, was unknown. He kept it secret. As if she might discover it, Poppy gazed into the forest. All she could make out was a great mass of dark trees. No wonder it was called dim, she thought, and shuddered. Poppy considered the distance from the north side of Bannock Hill, where she was hiding, to the dwelling on the abandoned farm where she and her family lived, Gray House. It was about the length of four cornfields. Poppy decided she'd best race from one protected spot to another in quick, low belly runs. She peeked out from beneath her bark again. There was a fallen branch up ahead, but it was leafless, so it would provide no cover. Beyond the branch, however, she spied a rock with a crevice large enough to wedge into. Poppy decided to aim for that. Whiskers stiffly alert, breathing deeply to catch the smallest whiff of danger, she crept out from under the protective piece of bark. If only, if only, she kept saying to herself, if only Mr. Okax wasn't watching. But Mr. Okax was watching. He was perched perfectly still on the dead branch of his tree with very wide open eyes. Not for a moment had he ceased staring at Poppy's hiding place. If there was one thing the owl hated more than a creature who neglected to ask permission to move about the territory, it was a creature who escaped punishment for not asking. How could he keep the mice terrified if any one of them got away with that? No, this Poppy must not escape. Mr. Okax belched, bringing up a pellet of ragweed's bones and fur, as well as the earring which he had been unable to digest. The pellet fell to the ground to lie among a large pile of other pellets. Intently, the owl moved his head from side to side, back and forth, adjusting his depth of vision. In time, he saw Poppy's pink nose poke out from her hiding place. Then he watched as she raced toward a rock. At last, the mouse was on the move. Mr. Okax clacked his beak with pleasure, spread his wings, and leaped into the air. Panting hard, but protected by the crevice, Poppy squirmed about and sniffed for hints of danger. She found none. Once she had caught her breath, she edged a bit out of her nook and studied the terrain. The nearest haven she could see was a bush whose partly exposed roots straddled a big hole enough to shelter her. Unfortunately, the bush was on the far side of a flat open space a long way from where she crouched. It was farther by far than the length of Gray's house attic, farther even than the water pump beyond the back door, farther, in fact, than Poppy had ever run without stopping to rest. She sighed with dismay. Then she looked again. This time she spied a rectangular strip of wood propped against a stone at an upward angle. It was about halfway between where she hunched and the hole. 
Poppy told herself that if she tired or if some danger appeared, she would be able to hide briefly beneath the high end. Tense, she examined the eastern sky once more. It had grown lighter. Was it day yet? Would Mr. Okax be asleep now? The owl cruising high to the west of Bannock Hill moved his wings slowly, wanting to make the least possible disturbance on the air. These deer mice, he knew, could be very sensitive. As he flew, he kept his eyes fixed on Poppy's rock. The mouse's run suggested what she was doing, moving from protected spot to protected spot. Mr. Okax was well aware that the biggest family of deer mice in his territory, headed by that old fool Lungwort, lived in Grey House. More than likely, this Poppy was heading there. Well then, how would she go? The owl spied a bush on the south side of the hill. Though it was some distance from the rock, it would be the logical next hiding place for the mouse. But if it came to a race for that bush, he knew he would win. Mr. Okax gave a hiss of satisfaction. Poppy cleared the rock crevice in one jump. Her landing, however, was awkward. It threw off a puff of dust. Swiftly, she scrambled back to her feet and then started to dash across the open area. Belly low, tail stiff as a nail, ears folded back, she pumped her legs like pistons. Mr. Okak, circling above, saw the dust caused by the mouse's jump. The next moment, he spotted Poppy. In a flash, he calculated her speed and direction, determining the exact spot where he could catch her. He made four quick, strong wing pumps, which brought him to the proper altitude. Then he dived. Poppy streaked over the ground. Though she felt as though her heart would burst, she was almost halfway to the bush. Soon she would be passing the wood strip. Mr. Okax, who had plummeted to a spot not far above and beyond behind Poppy, threw out his wings, pulled back his head, thrust his claws forward. In the anticipation of the meal he was about to eat, he clacked his beak. Poppy, hearing the clack, cast a lightning glance over her shoulder. Mr. Okax was right behind her, his fearsome talons set. The shock of seeing the owl so close surged through her like a bolt of electricity. With an enormous kick of her rear legs, she shot into the air, tumbling head over heels until she came down, belly flat, on the far end of the length of wood. Poppy's leap caught Mr. Okax by surprise. As he dived, Poppy took off, sensing he would miss her. He adjusted, up came his claws, down went his left wing. Over went his tail. What Mr. Okax achieved, however, was a careening swerve that brought him thrashing beyond his target onto the same strip of wood as Poppy, but on the opposite end. When Mr. Okax landed, his weight catapulted the light as a feather mouse into the air in a great arc that dumped her with a splat right at the base of the bush. Frantic, she clawed forward and tumbled head over heels into the hole she had been aiming for. Mr. Okak swiveled his head, first this way and then that, searching for his prey. She seemed to have vanished. Frustrated, he flapped into the air and circled low over Bannock Hill, but found no trace. 
seething, the owl headed back to Dimwood. How dare this mouse, this poppy, escape twice? Never before had a mouse done that. Mr. Ocax had half a mind to return to his watching tree and wait for the creature to pop up. The next moment, he decided against it. He was tired. Daylight had finally arrived. It was long past his sleeping time. Besides, he had eaten something. But as Mr. Ocax sailed deep into Dimwood toward his secret lair, he vowed to avenge himself. If mice began to get notions that they could escape him, there would be no end of trouble. Poppy lay in the hole beneath the bush, hurting from ears to tail. It took time for her breathing to become regular, longer still for her pulse to drop to normal. When she began to feel herself again, she tested her legs and toes to see if they worked. Everything seemed to be intact. Cautiously, she crawled to the top of the hole and stole a quick peek. Though she saw no sign of Mr. Ocax, she retreated hastily, still too agitated to do anything but hide. It was some time before Poppy took another look, then took a third. Though she still didn't see the owl, she hesitated. Mr. Ocax, she knew, was capable of great patience. So it was that the sun had risen quite high above the horizon before Poppy finally eased herself out of the hole. Following her plan of short runs and safe havens, she scampered at last down Bannock Hill to Gray House. According to Mice Family Stories, a human called Farmer Lamotte had lived in the house. When he and his family left, it was said to be many, many winters ago, the house started to collapse. The white walls turned ashen. The roof's middle dropped lower than either end. Windows fell out, doors fell in. The farmers cast off boots, old furniture, magazines crumbled. All in all, it was a perfect and safe home for Poppy's family. But as Poppy approached the house, she spied a small red flag hanging from one end of the roof. She stopped short. A red flag was her father's signal that the entire clan needed to gather for an emergency meeting. Poppy's first thought was that news of Ragweed's death had already reached home. Then she realized how unlikely that was. Something else of grave importance must have occurred. And that's the end of chapter three.